Hello, we're in chapter four of the Asphalt Plant Level 2 class. You're going to see in the next presentations that chapter four has been broken out into a, a few multiple presentations. The reason we've done it this way is we want to be able to show you a lot more detail on each test that is discussed in this chapter. For this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the asphalt concrete measurement or the furnace burn, and then we're going to also discuss uh, gradation. So the learning objectives here will be to measure the asphalt content or determine the asphalt content using the NCAP furnace. For that, the specification we use is VTM 102. After you've got your asphalt content measurement, you need to do a gradation on your mix. That gradation is done using Ashto T30. So when we talk about asphalt content or percent binder in the mix, we do follow Virginia test method VTM 102 to determine the asphalt content. And it's basically, we, we put a sample in a furnace like this and we, we burn off all the binder. I'll go into more detail how the furnace works as we go through the presentation. But prior to this furnace, we've only been using the furnace now for 20 years approximately. Um, prior to that, we used to do something called refluxes or centrifuges, uh, both of which can still be done if you, if you have an aggregate that doesn't work well in the furnace. The nice thing about using the furnace is I can get an asphalt content in an hour or less. When we've done the old reflux way, uh, method to measure the asphalt content, we could take four hours, or in some cases when you're dealing with high binder contents, whole days to get an asphalt content on one sample. So this is a much quicker way to measure our asphalt content, which is a, a huge benefit to the asphalt producer when he's trying to control his mix. Always want to talk about safety first, especially when you're dealing with a furnace. Furnace is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of the safety equipment you want to use, you, you want to have long sleeves like this lab coat has here, this gentleman has on. You want safety gloves. Uh, note a face shield here. That's one thing I see a lot of people not putting on is a face shield. They, they may, will stick on safety glasses, but if, at 1,000 degrees, if something come out and you, ain't got a, you only had glasses here and it hit you in the cheek, you're still going to get burnt. Uh, you just got to sit it on your head for 30 seconds to load or unload this thing. Keep your face shield and keep it near your furnace. Uh, this, this cage here is, uh, is just a way of, once I've taken my sample out, I will set it underneath this cage so no one can, by accident, touch the hot sample. Equipment that we need, of course we need the furnace, okay? These are pans that we're going to load the sample in. You'll see that done here in a minute. Uh, we need a scale to weigh our material, to, to get a sample weight on. We're going to need a larger pan and some, some um, spatulas and brushes to clean the, the aggregate out of our sample pans. And I need an oven. The reason I need an oven is if, if my mix has cooled down and gotten hard, I need to heat it back up so that I can make it workable to load into these baskets. First, we want to take the representative sample. We've already discussed this in previous uh, discussions and, and uh, classes. We take it by VTM uh, 48. It's taken from the center of the truck load. It's, you need a minimum of 10 pounds of material. Once I brought that 10 pounds of material in, now I want to do the quartering method here. I want to quarter these samples down for my testing to get a proper representative sample. Here is, is a lot of times I see people bring in these 10 pounds and they just scoop through it and put half a scoop on the first basket and half a scoop in the second basket. Uh, that can segregate the material. We need to make sure we quarter down to get proper representation before we start loading our baskets rather than just scooping, scooping it up. If your sample has gotten cooled down and it's now hard and it's not soft enough that you can load it into baskets, you, you have to reheat it in an oven at 257 plus or minus 9 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for 25 minutes, but not more than one hour. Now, notice this temperature is really a narrow range for what we do in asphalt, and this time is also narrow. The reason that we have such a tight limit on our asphalt when we're having to reheat our samples uh, that have cooled down too much is because if we heat them one too long, we can dr start driving off uh, light-in oils. Light-in oils are part of the asphalt binder content. We don't want to drive that off for two or three hours sitting in a, in a hot oven. Uh, we don't want the oven too hot. Notice the temperature here. This is a specification I think that's looked over a lot. When you're having to reheat a furnace burn sample, there's a temperature requirement and a time requirement both for these samples. Sample size varies depending on the aggregate size of our mix, okay? Uh, if you're doing a 9.5 mix, you want 1,200 grams minimum. Uh, if I'm doing a 19 millimeter mix, I want 2,000 grams 
minimum. Base mixes can get really big. BM25 is 3,000 grams minimum. But note here at the bottom of this slide, sample size should not be more than 500 grams greater than the minimum re recommended. These are minimums, okay, and then you can take each one of these numbers and add 500 and that becomes a maximum. The reason being, the way the furnace works, we have a correction factor. We'll talk more about that as we go through. The correction factor is established during the mix design process by your mix design technician. So when he created that correction factor, he had a known sample weight, a known amount of aggregate, and a known amount of binder that was mixed together and put in the furnace and burned off minimum of four samples to create a furnace correction factor. The variability in weight of those samples needs to stay within these ranges so that you don't have any error due to significant changes in sample weights, furnace sample weights. That's why you actually have a, a basically a maximum and minimum weight for our furnace samples. Real quick, nominal maximum aggregate size, you guys already know this, I'm sure. Nominal maximum aggregate sieve size is if one sieve size larger than the first sieve to retain more than 10% of the aggregate. You're talking about your 9.5 or your 9.0, that's 3 8 inch material. 12.5 is a half inch material, 19 millimeters, three quarter, and so on. All right, now let's talk about the furnace itself. Uh, furnace is always preheated at 538 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. As, as a note to, to you all, if you have an aggregate with an extremely high correction factor, there is a process where you can request to burn at a cooler temperature. Um, it's, it, it's in the ASHTO procedure for the furnace. In order to burn at a cooler temperature, oh, you have to get with your engineer, your VDOT representative, and request permission to burn at a cooler temperature so that they would also burn at the same temperature. The furnace correction factor is supplied by the mix design technician. Uh, this is asphalt plant level two class, so this is for, for production testing purposes but you would get a number, correction factor, from your mix design technician. And the way to the sample the mix uh, is monitored during the burn process and the asphalt contents based off the weight loss. In this furnace, there's a scale built in the bottom portion here. This scale continuously weighs the sample while it's burning. And it weighs until the, the weight loss becomes constant, and that's when it stops the test automatically. Here we are loading a set, uh, a set of baskets. Notice when he's loading his baskets, he has a spatula here. He doesn't want his asphalt material to touch the side because during the burn, material can fall out. If it falls out and it doesn't stay in these baskets, the furnace would perceive it as asphalt binder being lost, and it wasn't binder. It was aggregate. So you want to have it approximately a half inch all the way around in both baskets. Um, once we've got it properly dispersed in our two baskets, we want to write our sample weight down. We're going to need this weight before we start running our furnace sample. One thing I will tell you, I've recently seen in the marketplace, instead of having two baskets here, there's three baskets being supplied. I love the concept of having a third basket because the thinner I spread my material out, the more efficient and probably quicker burn I'm going to receive. One word of caution though, if I go to a three basket system, VDOT should do the same. Also, if you go to a three basket system, you need to verify your correction factors the same if you're using three baskets instead of four, uh, two baskets. Okay? So if we go changing any variable like that, we need to make sure that everything stays the same. Now we're loading the furnace here. You're going to enter a sample weight. That's what he's doing here with this, this uh, numerical pad here. He's entering a sample weight. And then we're going to load the furnace. See here, as I say, the oven's 1,000 degrees. When you open it, you feel the heat really quick. Uh, he's just loading his sample. But when he loads a sample, he wants to make sure that this basket isn't touching the side of the internal chamber of the furnace or the back. If, you're, if your basket is, is, touches either the sides or the back, it can influence your test results. So it's very important that this set basket be set right in the center of this furnace on a way platform. You really, the picture's hard to see, but there's a way platform here that you're setting your sample on. Once your sample is complete, the furnace turns off. Once it's cut off, you can now remove your sample. This is what is happening here. He's removing his sample. And notice that he's placed it underneath the safety basket so that no, you know, someone else just comes to your lab, 
tell you you got a phone call. You don't want them going by and touching the basket being curious. You don't want anybody getting burnt. Now we have a video to look at to, that will show you a demonstration of how this process works. To begin with, you need to get the sample weight of your mixture sample you're going to burn in the furnace. You've got 1,654 grams here for your sample weight. Notice now he's teared off his baskets. That's so that he can verify when he loads his sample in that he has that 1,654 minus a gram or two things can happen. He's removed both the top and the top basket. He's applying half of his sample into the, the uh, first basket. If you see the, underneath that first basket, some material fell through onto the, the pan of the furnace uh, basket apparatus, and you, that is fine. It will still burn clean. Uh, he's spreading his sample out now, nice and uniform. This looks really nice. He's got about a half inch all the way around the sample. Looks really good. Now he'll fill up the next basket on top, the second basket. One thing I will mention to you guys, I haven't done this, but I've been told by a couple people that a lot of times they'll put a little hole in the middle of their sample once it's been spread out. And obviously a hole is they just move the material just enough so that they can see air through the middle. They say it seems to burn a little cleaner there. Uh, I do know sometimes the center of these samples don't burn completely. You still have some black residue, and, and they said that eliminates that. Again, the second basket looks great. You can see a half inch all the way around the material. Uh, that looks really good. Now he's going to put the top to, to both baskets back on, and he's going to verify his weight. Again, 1,652.6 grams. Uh, he had 1,654 to begin with. That's, that's good. He lost a gram somewhere. I mean, that could be anything. All right, now he's getting a combined weight, 4,896 grams. He's doing that for when he's getting ready to load his furnace. The weight he's going to put in the furnace here is his sample weight. We had 1,652.6. If you notice, he typed in 1,653 because there's no decimal place in the furnace. He just rounded up. Here he's putting in his correction factor. Correction factor that some materials technicians supplied him was 0 0.40. He's entered those weights in. Now he's ready to load his sample. Once he starts to load the sample into the furnace, you can see here the platform I was talking about. That's the platform he's loading it. He's making sure it isn't touching on his sides, touching on the bottom. His furnace is reading 4,900 grams. His combined weight from his scale was 4,896 grams, and that's going to be plus or minus three or four grams. Now, he's basically, his furnace burn has completed. Um, it, it cuts off automatically, and what he's doing now is he's hitting the stop button. The stop button will unlock the furnace so you can open the door. When you hit start, it locks for safety. Okay, the furnace will stop recording weights and start, stop the testing process, but it doesn't cool off. Obviously, it's still hot in there, and the door is kept locked until you hit the stop button. Now that he removed his sample, he's covering it with a container, with a basket, so that no one gets burnt here. Obviously, now in this video, his sample's cooled down. Otherwise, he wouldn't be reaching around and touching it with no gloves. <laughs> so he's, he's taking his sample, and he's prepared to go do his gradation. Uh, first thing he's got to do is clean out these baskets. Now we got our asphalt content from our furnace burn. Uh, the ticket literally calculates the asphalt content for you. It tells you the, uh, you got an initial weight, you got a weight loss, or several categories on the ticket, but it'll give you an actual asphalt content of your sample. Once we've done that, sample's cooled to room temperature, we're, time, we're ready to do our gradation. To do that, we're going to follow AASHTO T30 procedure, and the beginning part of that is the sample must be washed over the minus 200 sieve. Step one is to remove the sample from the basket and wash it over that sieve. Uh, here it is. The technician is going to clean out his furnace baskets. Notice he has a very large pan, big enough that the baskets will fit down in, and he won't lose material while he's cleaning it out takes the first basket, he drops it just a couple inches just to, do, to break the, the, the material. The aggregate is sort of packed in there with that extreme heat. Now he's cleaning it out. Notice I'm, I'm jealous of this system he has set up. He's got a fan right here in front of him. 
If anybody's ever done these furnace, cleaned out these furnace baskets, dust comes up in you in, while you're doing it. And this is a way of making sure the dust doesn't end up, it blows away from you while you're doing, cleaning them out. You can tell here from his hand, he's putting a lot of pressure as he cleans the baskets out which is excellent. He's using a very stiff, you can see the brush he's using is a stiff wire brush. Now he's grabbing a paintbrush just to do the final cleaning of, of the basket. The same will be done for both baskets. You, 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 you can't be, you don't want to be gingerly when you're doing this. You want to make sure you're, you're getting everything out. So you want to do a really good job of cleaning all your material out of these baskets. Once he's done the baskets, he's got the bottom pan. See the material that fell on there, it's also burned clean but he wants to make sure that's cleaned out so for that he just uses his paintbrush and he wipes all the material down into his sample. Now he's got his sample in this large pan and he needs to know how much it weighs. Here he has a bowl on his scale, he's tearing it off and he's going to just transfer his sample from the large pan into the bowl for, for obtaining that weight. Notice he's using a paintbrush to make sure he gets all the material in there. And it looks like his sample weight's uh, 1555.2. That's the uh, weight before washing. Now that he's got his weight before washing, he's going to proceed to do a hand, uh, wash this by hand. Um, there are automatic washing systems, little drums that are on the market, and they're approved by specification, but a lot of people still do it, wash, uh, wash these samples by hand. Um, notice he added a drop of wetting agent there. Wetting agent is nothing more than a single drop of, of some sort of soap, uh, any kind of soap, liquid soap that you would have. Notice how dirty the water is there. Notice he's pouring it over a 16 sieve. Below that 16 sieve is a number 200 sieve because we are washing our samples over the minus 200 sieve. That's what he's doing here. Notice how clean the water's got. This didn't happen in two washes. He's probably been washing this for four or five minutes to get it that clean. We, we got video editing, slow it down for us. <laughs> uh, but now he's got a nice clean sample and he's ready to dry it and move toward his gradation. Before he does that, he's got to get everything out of these sieves. Uh, he's put his sample back over there and he's gonna just rinse these sieves off can't really brush this material off. You have to just rinse it off with the water, but you want to make sure it all stays in your sample. Look at the fines that are on his 200 sieve. There's a lot of fines here. So he wants to rinse them down. While he's rinsing them down to one side of the sieve, that water is going down the drain because nothing that passed that sieve is, is a sample. And he's now cleaned it out in his, in his bowl, and that is his uh, washed sample that needs to be dried before he can actually do his gradation. Want to make sure you keep all the sample in your, uh, in your pan, take time to rinse it out real clean. Then you want to spread this sample out so it dries as fast as possible. Here you can see that. From here we just transfer it to an oven and it stays in the oven until dry. Once our sample is dried, we need to record this weight. So we take the oven dry sample weight that was washed and we'll get a weight on a scale. After we've done that, now we've got a, our dry, cool sample, it ought to cool down, we want to load our sample into our nest of sieves. Nest of sieves can be called nest of sieves, stack of sieves. Uh, they go from smallest at the bottom to largest at top with a catch pan on the bottom. Um, once we've done that, we're going to put our nest of sieves in a mechanical shaker that we have. This picture here is of an older shaker. Uh, it does more of a, a, a swirling uh, type motion. That, that shakes the material so that it's allowed to separate based on individual size fractions. There's others that sort of lay at an angle and sort of roll the whole nest of sieves. But because of these different shaking apparatuses that do this, it's very important you calibrate your, your, your sieving time. All right. Typically everybody wants to just hit 10 minutes. That's just what everybody's always done shaking time wise is they, they should sieve for 10 minutes. But the question is, is 10 minutes good enough for your material to properly, based on your shaking apparatus, have given you a good, thorough distribution of your gradation? In order to do that, to calibrate it, you need to look at Ashto T30, sort of the procedure is spelled out. Basically what you do is you batch up a sample in your lab of a known gradation. You put your materials in your shake, in your sieves, in your mechanical shaker, you shake it for that 10 minutes. 
Okay, at the end of that 10 minutes, you, you take each individual sieve and you handshake it for one minute. And you see how much more material passes that sieve. As long as you don't have any material or, or very minute amount past that sieve, your 10 minute time is sufficient. I've seen for a lot of the rotary shakers, it need to be more like 12 or 13 minutes to achieve proper uh, sieving time to get good representation of, of the gradation process. So here's a video of the uh, sieving apparatus. Technician is just taking his, his oven dry sample out. He lets it cool. There's a fan. It's hard to see on the left there, but there's a fan. He's cooling it off before he does his gradation. Now he's getting a weight. This would be re uh, recorded as his weight after washing. Okay? Yeah, the first weight we took before we washed it, you had to wait before washing. This is weight after washing. Now he's transferring his sample after he's written the weight down to, to the, his nest of sieves, again, with the largest sieve on top to the finest sieve on bottom. From here, he's going to transfer his entire nest of sieves to his mechanical shaker. He has the more the kind that sort of lays back at a 30, 35 degree angle, and the sieves themselves rotate in a circle inside this chamber. Once our, our calibrated shaking time is finished, whether it be 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever it takes, uh, to make sure we've got a proper distribution of our materials within our gradation, we need to weigh each sieve individually. Uh, here we are taking a weight per each sieve, dumping it into a pan. Notice she's got a brush. She's cleaning out each sieve very well, making sure she's getting all the material off of each sieve. Uh, you have to be careful not to overload any sieves. There are weight restrictions for each size sieve that it can hold. Now we'll show a video of that. All right, here he has. He's got his nest of sieves. You can see he's beginning to clean them out. Again, looks like about a 3 8 sieve there. Uh, notice he's got a spatula to clean these out. He's writing the weight down. It's not shown in the video, but he's actually writing the weight down in between each sieve because he needs to know the weight that was retained on each sieve. Notice he's switched to a different brush here. Uh, this one's still a metal brush, but it, so he can clean the sieves real well. Now when he gets down to the really fine sieves, he's got a, a hair brush because you don't want to damage your sieves. But notice he's weighed each one of these fractions all the way down to the pan weight and he's recording each weight individually. All right, now that we've completed the actual gradation process or test, we need to calculate the results. To do that, um, well to start with, notice this example problem here has the weight retained on each individual sieve, a 3 8 4 8 all the way down to the 200. Um, remember, as we showed earlier in this presentation, we had to note the weight before washing. This was the sample weight right after we cleaned it out of the furnace basket and before we, we washed it. That was 1,485.3 grams. Uh, once we'd washed it and dried it, um, this is considered the sample weight after washing, which is 1,391.8 grams, okay? So here, once we have these two weights, we were able to then load it in our nest of sieves, do our gradation, and these were the weights on each individual sieve. One thing I got noted here in red is just to remind me to point out to you guys something. There are different size sieves available in the, in the industry. Our videos showed 8-inch diameter sieves. 8-inch diameter sieves uh, are very common. They, they were been used in asphalt, started back during the Marshall days. Typically, they're called soil sieves now, and the larger 12-inch diameter sieves are called aggregate sieves. Doesn't make a difference what you use. The point is you have to be careful not to overload a sieve when you're actually doing a gradation. And the reason I point that out, um, for this particular gradation we did, which was on a surface mix, I can tell that SM9 mix, just based on the weights retained here, 
that um, where I had over 500 grams of material retained on my number four sieve tells me that this gradation, one, had to be done either on 12-inch diameter sieves or I had to take and split it in half to do it on 8-inch sieves. The reason I say that is in the Ashto T30 test procedure, there is a table that tells you how much material can be retained on each sieve. It, it spells it out, okay? And the maximum for 8-inch diameter sieves that can be retained is 330 grams. We had over 500. So I, if I'm using 8-inch diameter sieves for this particular 9.5 gradation, I would have to separate that into two gradations and then recombine it mathematically before I've done my total calculation. Okay? So remember, we talked about calibrating the, the shaker, mechanical shaker time. One more thing to, to pay attention to with gradations is not to overload any sieves. Okay? And there is, is references to those weights in Ashto T30. Going forward, let's talk about the uh, calculations. We're going to calculate percent retained and percent passing in order to do our, our gradation to the end. We always refer to gradations, and when we talk about increments of a gradation, we refer to them as a percent passing. Here's the formula for percent retained. It's, it's a simple math. You got the weight retained on each individual sieve divided by the dry sample weight before washing times 100. All they're doing there is converting it to a percentage. Okay, so I get the weight retained on each sieve. I take the re weight retained on that sieve, divide it by the sample weight before washing. For total passing, to do that, I first got to know what my percent retained was because I take the percent passing on the sieve larger minus the percent retained on the sieve I'm calculating it for. Don't worry, we'll explain how that works now. Here again, same gradation we were just talking about. Uh, we're calculating percent retained. Obviously, if there was no weight retained on a half inch sieve, the percent retained on a half inch is zero. <laughs> There's nothing there. Okay, now we're going to talk about how if we had, we had 52.5 grams of weight retained on a 3 h sieve. All right, so I take that 52.5, my weight retained on that sieve, divided by my dry sample weight before washing, which I have right here, 14,085.3 grams. Get that answer times 100 to move the decimal two places, I have 3.5% retained on my 3 8 inch sieve. This formula stays constant all the way down my percent retained column. The only ch change I would make to the formula is I have to insert the weight retained on each sieve. So for my number four sieve, I got 507.6 grams. I'm dividing it again by my sample weight before washing convert it to a percentage, 34.2. Again, the number eight sieve, 263.3 grams retained on the number eight sieve, divided by weight before washing, times 100, 17.7, and so on and so on as we go through the gradation. Get down here to the bottom, you're having less material retained on it, you have less, less percent retained on it, makes sense, right? You got 49.4 grams on the number 100. Divide that again by the same sample weight before washing times 100. That's only 3.3% retained on that sieve. And again, for the number 200, it's 2.6. Now we've calculated all our percent retained. I have my weights in grams and my percent retained column here. The next thing we want to calculate is our percent passing. Again, as I said earlier, this is what we use to talk about when we reference a gradation. We are always discussing it as a percent passing uh, combination. To do that, we take the percent uh, passing one larger minus the percent retained. If there was nothing retained on the half inch sieve, how much is passing that sieve? 100% of everything. The entire gradation passed it. So you just put 100 here. No calculation. Zero means I got 100. Now, when I'm working at the 3 8 I take percent pass in one sieve larger, which is at 100, minus the percent retained on the sieve. I'm calculating for my 3 8 inch sieve, percent retained is 3.5, 
So 100 minus 3.5 tells me they got 96.5% retained on the 3 8 inch sieve. Simple, straightforward math. Uh, again, these, these formulas, the numbers you're inputting in this formula will change as you work down the problem. When we calculated over here, we kept the uh, weight before washing constant. For the, the formula doesn't change, but the numbers that are inputted in this formula all the way down will change. What changes is, I need to know percent passing one sieve larger. I've got this 96.5, it's probably still in your calculator. I go minus 34.2% retained, tells me I got 62.3% passing the number four sieve. Again, in your calculator, you got 62.3, I'm going to subtract 17.7% retained, gives me 44.6% passing the number eight SIF. Okay? That's the way the process will, will progress all the way down the percent passing column. Notice here again, if you notice you got the, the uh, anytime you have a smaller weight retained on a sieve, you're also going to have a smaller number for the percent passing all on the same sieve. Here for this particular sample, here would, this represents our percent passing gradation. I got 6.3 minus 200 in it. Uh, uh, we got the uh, number four sieve was 62.3. Through these calculations, we've calculated this, and this is the data that we enter into our Mincer Plaid system, or this is what we, our specifications are set that we control our gradations by. All specifications for mixes are based on percent passing. It's a blended percent passing for that mix. This is the calculations we do. With that, we covered how to do an IA sample or a, a QC sample. We ran through furnace burn, how to run a furnace sample. That's where we attained our asphalt content. And now we went through the process of washing the gradation and then doing a sieve analysis to, to calculate the final gradation on our material. These are the primary variables we use to monitor and, and to control our mixes. It's our asphalt content and our gradation. Um, hope this information was helpful. Have a good day.